I'm glad to have the chance to talk to you today about Exanasis 2. Um, I assume that everybody has some experience with the original Exanasis, and uh, what I'm going to focus on today are the differences between the original version and what's new in Exanasis 2. Uh, Exanasis 2 is uh, completely rewritten from the original Exanasis. Everything from the user interface to the way that we access data to the display of the products has been uh, totally updated. And uh, we haven't taken anything away from the original. All the original stuff is still there. We've just added quite a bit to it. Uh, the new product has really a lot of increased flexibility for you, the users. Uh, you can have a lot more control over the product and what things you can specify, uh, things that you didn't have control over, like uh, number of missing days to allow it a month before uh, not computing a summary statistic, a statistic for the month. A lot of different ways of selecting stations, uh, rather than just the static list that you currently have access to in Exabasis. Uh, we've changed the way that the product are products are displayed, giving you a lot more control over them. A lot of the products are now interactive to let you uh, format them or really focus in on what you're after. And uh, we also have added quite a few data sets uh, that weren't in ACES before, things like COCORAS, uh, SNOWTEL, RAWS, and the, the CRN, to name a few. And uh, we have added some new products. There are three brand new single station products and six multi-station products in Examasis 2. And we also enhanced many of the existing products, so they uh, should be a lot more useful now. As far as browser support, Examasis 2 was developed using Safari and Chrome, and so we have uh, the most confidence in, in those two browsers. We have also tested it quite a bit in Firefox and haven't seen any problems there as well. It's only had some limited testing in Internet Explorer, but uh, we expect everything to work uh, from version 7 on up. Uh, Internet Explorer 6, uh, we probably probably won't support everything that we, we have in Exanasis 2, but we think all the major browsers should operate just fine. Uh, one thing that some of our beta testers did find that uh, they occasionally had problems with bandwidth. I guess some of the offices are have pretty low bandwidth going into their office, and so there are a couple of products in particular that um, might be hampered a little bit by the lack of bandwidth, and I'll point those out as I come to that, and that's an area that we're really going to be focusing on uh, improving as we work on uh, additional en uh, enhancements to XMAs. For those that are on the technical side and would like to know kind of what's running under the hood, uh, Exanasis 2 is written in JavaScript and makes extensive use of uh, the jQuery and jQuery UI libraries. Uh, it uses ASUS Web Services version 2 for its data access. And for the display of graphs, it uses the high charts JavaScript library. Uh, we have some map interfaces built into Exanasis 2 and those use Google Maps, and we use a jQuery plugin called Table Sorter for the tabular display that gives you a, a lot of flexibility in, uh, in playing around with the results that you get. And I would like to thank the beta testers that we had for Exanasis 2. They gave a lot of really valuable comments and suggestions, and uh, a lot of the enhancements that I've made over the course of the development of, of, the, of the product have come from the uh, suggestions that they've made. So I'd really like to thank them for, for their input. So now I'm going to kind of dive into Examasis 2. OK, so um, this is uh, just the opening screen. You'll see that there is a link there to the old uh, version of Examasis. Well, it will be the old once version 2 comes out. So you will still be able to get to that after Examasis 2 is released. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, at the end. But right now, I'd really like to focus in on, on showing off some of the products that we have available and get you started so that you'll be able to, to dig in and start using it yourselves. Uh, along the left-hand side of the screen, 
you will see at the top a list of the products that are available. There are broken up into single station products and multi-station products. After you select your product, there's an area where um, product-specific options will be displayed for you to, uh, to set up the way that you want to see things, and then uh, an area to make the selection of the stations that you're going to be performing the operations on. So let's start out at the very top here to the temperature graphs. This was a product that was available in uh, in the original version of XMASIS, and we have spruced it up a little bit. Uh, we have choices here for all the major time periods you might want to analyze, and right down to a month or down to other where you can uh, select any range of uh, month, months and days that you would like to see. So let's just look at the, uh, at the spring here, and then we will click on the station selection tab here, and uh, the options will be hidden there, and the station selection options will show up. And this is where you will see um, a lot more flexibility than you had before. We still have the, the old station list like you, you had before, the ones that are currently the same as what you have in Exabasis. Uh, if you want to get to a station in another CWA, we have a a drop down list here that you can select any of the other CWAs if you want to look at their station list, uh, select stations from there. We'll just stick with the Albany CWA for now. Uh, the other way that you can access stations is by station ID. So if we click this tab here, we'll see that uh, selections come up where you can type in an ID. It can be a, a co-op ID if you want to. Uh, it can be a Wayband ID be an ICAO ID, NWSLI, COCORAS ID, all of a host of different ways of specifying the station that you want. Usually this uh, type here will change as you change the ID. Uh, it will match up for you automatically. If we have a data set where an ID might be ambiguous between two different uh, data sets, uh, you might need to change your ID type here. But Usually, uh, that will be taken care of for you. You won't even have to worry about it. The third way of accessing stations is using a search feature, where you can type in a city and state. It doesn't have to be a co-op station name. It can just be a place name or a zip code. Uh, let's type in Lake Tahoe here and click on our search button. And it will pop up a Google map centered on the location that you ask for, and then has icons indicating all the stations that it found that are nearby that, that uh, target location that you had. Let's just zoom in here a little bit. You'll see there are a few different types of icons on the map to try to show you the different station types that are available. Uh, the blue push pins that you see here are for mainly National Weather Service co-op or first order weather stations. As you toggle over the, or move your mouse over them, uh, at the bottom of the map, it will show the name of that station. Uh, the ones that have the icons that um, look kind of like the NRCS logo, those are Snowtel stations. So those are available. You wouldn't have seen those before. And the ones that look like a, a little fire here are ones that are raw stations, another new data set that you have available. If you click on uh, or double click on one of the stations, you'll get a little box come up uh, that will give you basic sta station information. So we lo we're looking at South Lake Tahoe Airport here, and it gives you the latitude and longitude, other information, and down at the bottom, it gives you the available date range for each of the variables. So you'll have a little bit better idea of what's available before you start uh, pulling up products for the station. And as you click on stations on the map, they will be updated in the drop-down list that you have along the left. So we've clicked on South Lake Tahoe. That's now the highlighted one. And these are sorted from closest to farthest away. So let's stick with South Lake Tahoe here and bring up our, our product. So here is the temperature graph that we have uh, for this spring. Uh, set up pretty much like the old ones, but I think it's a little a little sharper. And it does have some interactive features to it as well. Uh, 
first, you'll notice at the top that it gives the, the period of record uh, for, for the extremes, for the record daily maximum temperatures and minimum temperatures, and also the period for the normals, which will always be 1981 to 2010 for at least the next 27 years or so. Um, and then as you move your cursor across the graph, it will bring up the actual values. You don't have to try to follow over to the axis to figure out what, a, what an exact value is. It will give you all the numbers for the, the max min for the day, uh, for the normals, and for the records. And the other thing that you can do is you can drag your uh, cursor across the portion of the graph and it will zoom in uh, to that portion so you can get a little bit closer look at uh, any portion of the graph that you want to. And the other nice feature is in the upper right-hand corner of the graph, you'll see that there is a button to, uh, to print the graph and another button here that you can use to save the graph in a, in a number of different formats. It's a ping or JPEG, PDF, or a vector image. So you have quite a, a bit of uh, flexibility now in what you can do with the temperature graphs. Now we'll move on to the other purely graphic product, which is the accumulation graphs. These were known as precipitation graphs in the previous version of Examasis, but you can see that we have other things you can accumulate now, like snowfall and degree days. So uh, the basic graph, uh, if you just pull it up here, and we're going to switch to, to Ithaca now. So here you have the, uh, the highest year uh, in the blue, the normal year in the brown, the current year in the green, and then the driest year in the red. And you'll notice that uh, this dry year, 1923 for Ithaca, um, shows no precipitation at all for the first four months of the year. Uh, missing data, by the way, is indicated by the, the little diamonds along the graph. So, uh, during the early 20s, precipitation wasn't recorded at the Ithaca weather station, so we don't have any data for the, those months, so that's not a very good indication of our driest year. But if we go back to our options selection here and click on more options, we can set the number of missing values that we want to allow. So instead of allowing just an unlimited number of missing values, let's only consider years that have no more than one day missing. If we redo our graph now, you'll see that that 1923 is now being ignored, and instead 1985 is showing up as being the, the driest year for this uh, particular period of record for Ithaca. And if you remember on the old version of, of Examasis, if you were looking for a precipitation graph, you could uh, asked to plot another year, and you had to specify what year it was. And that was always a little bit difficult if you couldn't re remember really what that dry year was in the 90s that you wanted to see, and you had to maybe poke around a little bit to find that year that you're interested in. So now we have the uh, ability over here to click other years, and you don't specify what other year you want right now. Instead, you will be given the year that you ask for and a table below it with all the years of record and what the precipitation was uh, for the period that we're looking at, January 1st to, to May 21st, and giving you the precipitation for each year. So you can find that year, like if it was 1997 that you were looking for, there it is with 8.7 inches. You can click on that and that year will be uh, plotted you find a, another one that looks like it might be interesting, you can click on that, and you can keep clicking years here, and, and they'll be plotted on, the, on, on your graph. Uh, to get rid of them, just click on the box below again, and, and those years will be removed. Uh, these are sorted going from driest to wettest. You can click on the button in the upper right portion of this table, and it will resort that by, uh, by year now. So if you just want to look at the last three years, you can click off those years and, and they will be plotted on your graph. The other thing is that you can look for periods longer than one year. That was a, a limitation in the previous version of XMASIS that we've overcome now. 
let's say you want to look at like the last year and a half here. So we're going to change our starting date to January 1st of 2012. And we're going to, to see what we get here. And you'll see that the graph looks a, a little bit different now. It's a little bit different type of graph. And it gives you, again, a little bit more flexibility on, on how you view it. Uh, we've got the data here from January 2012 right up through the, the present day. And there's kind of a smooth image of that down below. Now, if we click one of the navigation buttons in the upper left, it allows us to zoom in. Let's look at a, a three-month period here. So we're looking at the most recent three months. You can drag the slider along the bottom to other periods of time. You can look for any other uh, three-month period that you might be interested in. And you can change the, the size of the slider, too, to be whatever you, you would like it to be and move through the data. So you can, uh, you can use that. And let's look at Snowfall now. And let's go back to 1990 for our starting year. We bring that up. Uh, not really terribly useful. Um, it, you can even add the, the normal on there. And it doesn't really tell us a, a whole lot looking at it this way. But we do have one more feature in the accumulation graphs. And that's the reset accumulation button over here on the left. We click that. And let's reset our accumulation on October 1st of every year. And get that. And now you have a, a useful product. For each year from 1990 through the, the current year, you get a kind of a, a small version, but a, a easy to see version of how the snowfall accumulated and able to compare that to normal. You can quickly see the years that were above and below normal. If there's one that looks particularly interesting to you, you can, you can zoom in on that like we did before. You can drag across it. And we'll zoom in on that. You can take a closer look at that year and, and see how things progressed. So a few features that we've added to the uh, accumulation graph. The next product is one that we've uh, had for quite a while. It's uh, the Daily Almanac. Um, <coughs> we haven't done too much to change this. We did add a lot of additional summarization. So it takes a little bit longer for the, the product to, to appear because it's essentially uh, reading in the entire period of record, and then finding all the extreme highest and lowest values for not only the, the current day, but for the month to date and for the year to date. At the bottom is the, the period of record, so you can know over what period we were looking at these extreme values. And you can also compare this to other years. If I want to compare it to last year, I can select 2012, and we'll add a column here for 2012, so we can quickly compare this year to, to last year. Or if we want to compare it to 2000, we can do that, and, and this will change to, to 2000. So we can qu quickly compare to other years. The only other, really, options that we've added here is you can specify the number of missing values that you're going, going to allow for these monthly and, and annual accumulations. Next on the list is a brand new product. Uh, we decided to call it Time Series for a Day. Uh, originally, when we had this program here at the, the Climate Center, we always called it the wedding program, because we would have young women calling up and saying that they are getting married on June 15th of 2014 and want to know what the weather is going to be like for that day. You probably get calls like that quite often yourself. And so we came up with a something that can give a climatology for one day. Uh, another name that we had for it was the Activity Planner, but you guys already used that name for something else. So we are calling this uh, program the Time Series for a Day. Again, you can um, select the day of interest. Uh, we use this quite often uh, to do stories about White Christmas. And so we'll, set, we'll uh, choose December 25th uh, to make our Output a little bit more compact. Let's just look at 1990 through present for this demonstration. And so for each year, we get the data for December 25th, the five main variables, uh, max min temperature, precip, snowfall, and snow depth. And then at the bottom of the page, a summary for each variable, giving the, the maximum and minimum and average of each of the variables. And then the percent of years that exceed certain thresholds. 
So if we're looking at white Christmas, we would probably want to go down to snow depth. Uh, looking at the percent of days with more than an inch of snow on the ground on Christmas morning, and for Ithaca, that happens to be 61%. See, the next product that we have is another one that we've uh, had for, uh, for quite a while, and this is just a basic uh, summary for the month. It's like it was before, except we've added a little bit of color here to, to show the extreme values so that they uh, stand out a little bit more for you. And we do have two options along the left here on how to handle average temp temperatures. This has been a big topic of discussion over the last year or so uh, among the members of the National Data Stewardship Team and the correct way to figure out the monthly average temperature. There are a couple of ways of doing it. The way that is preferred by the National Data Stewardship Team is uh, what we're referring to as full precision. And in that, we take essentially the average of all the average temperatures to come up with the monthly average. Now, there is also a method which we refer to as intermediate rounding, where um, we can take a look at that. And what that does is it takes the average max, rounds it to the nearest, nearest tenth, takes the average min, rounds it to the nearest tenth, and then rounds the, or averages those two rounded numbers to come up with a monthly average. Uh, we do have a... a icon that you can hover over here that gives you a more uh, complete description uh, that the intermediate rounding method uh, had been used by NCD and the NCDC and the local climatological data publications. I think that they might have recently uh, changed over to, to full precision, but if for some reason you want to have compatibility with the old LCDs, you can use this intermediate rounding, but Full precision is, is really the, the preferred method. Uh, daily data listing is uh, pretty much the same, except you can specify the, the days that you're interested in. Um, you can set any period of time that you want, uh, and you can pick the variables that you want. Uh, quite often, you might want to use this with a CSV output option, and then you can uh, get your results you can copy them and paste them into Excel or something else if you want to do uh, additional analyses on your own. Now, again, if you went back to the old Eximasis, you would, might remember that there were three different programs to do calendar day summarizations. There was calendar day averages, calendar day frequencies, and calendar day extremes. And in the uh, current version, or in the new version, rather, of XMASIS, we have combined all these into one product just called Calendar Day Summaries. And you can still get your, your extremes. Uh, you have the maximum and minimum here. You can get your averages. You have the mean. And you can get your frequencies with the, the percent or, or number of years. So they're all combined into, into one place now. And let's bring up for maximum temperature, highest maximum temperature for each day. And we have the table here with the uh, highest value for each month highlighted. So those are the daily records. Now, I think the number one most requested thing ever in the original version of Eximasis was, what year did these occur? So now we, we have that as an option. You can click Include Year of Occurrence and get that, and there you've got the year that they occurred along with the record value. Uh, like the calendar day summaries, we also combined the monthly uh, summaries with a, a same type of interface here, where again, you can get the, the average or the total or the extremes or the, or the frequencies all combined into one. Uh, let's take a look this time at precipitation. Uh, look at the total precipitation and just let's bring that up so we get uh, all the years here, make it a little bit more compact. Again, let's reduce our, our year range. So we've got the values for every year. At the bottom, there's the mean, the maximum, and the minimum. And the one thing that you can do with all the tables is that you can sort them by column. So let's say that for January, 
we can see that the maximum precipitation uh, during this period of record was 4.28 inches in a month. But maybe we want to know the second highest. So you can scan all the way back through here and eventually pick it out. But uh, instead of doing that, you can click on the column header. So let's click on January here. The first click will sort those uh, values in that column from lowest to highest. And then you click it again, and it goes from highest to lowest. So we can find that 3.96 was our, our second highest value. You can click on the column heading of, of any column, and it will, will sort for you and toggle back and forth between ascending and descending. Uh, there are a few other options here. You can uh, set the range of months that you're looking at. If you are looking at something like snowfall, you might want to go from July through June instead of January through, uh, through December. So you can do that. It will uh, reorder the columns for you. Uh, you can set the number of missing values. Uh, here you can include the, the date of occurrence like you could on the calendar day summaries. Uh, you can have it just report to you the number of missing days. And one thing that was in the um, development versions of the original XMASIS but never made it into the operational was something that, that I know Marina was interested in, and that's where you can select the years that uh, that you want to have displayed in the table. Let's make this a little bit longer time period. Let's look from 1980 through 2013. And you can click off the years that you're interested in. Uh, at some point, it might be nice to add buttons here for El Nino years or La Nino years, something like that. But for the time being, you can just go through and uh, click off whatever years you're interested in. It will save those and then run the product again, and it will come up with only those years that you've had checked off. And again, give you your summarization, mean, max, and min, uh, just for those uh, years that are shown in the table. Another brand new product is called the, the Seasonal Time Series. And I hope if you take nothing else away from this webinar that you will uh, be convinced that this is something that you really want to use. Uh, in the old version of XMASIS, if you wanted to do something like looking at the ranked summertime temperatures, a lot of you would go into extremes, uh, you set this to be the period of record, you would set your beginning date to June 1st and your ending date to August 31st, and then you figured out that that period was 92 days, so you set that to 92, wanted to get your top 10, and you got your results that way. So we have made it a lot easier in XMASIS 2. Uh, you select the, the variable that you want. Uh, let's just look at precipitation here. And then you can select your period of interest. Uh, again, the major seasons, uh, the entire year, uh, any month that you want, and if you don't like any of those, again, you can type in any range of dates that you're interested in. Let's look at the spring here and just run that. And so it gives you both a graph of the value for each year for the period that you selected, and then below is the table uh, consisting of all the values. And again, like any other table, you can click on that to get ascending and descending. I think that that will be a lot easier way uh, to get your, your seasonal statistics. It's a lot faster than using extremes, both in the setup and in the retrieval of the data. It's a lot more reliable as well. We had a lot of problems with the old system uh, in dealing with leap year. You had to go through a couple steps and combine results to get your averages for, for leap years. Uh, this is all taken care of now. Uh, you don't have to go through all those convolutions. So I really hope that you will uh, remember this product and use this in, in preference to using extremes to get those kinds of summaries. Uh, another thing that we have here, which has been a topic of discussion, and the data stewardship team is how to calculate seasonal average temperatures. So do you take an average of the monthly values in the in the season, or do you average up all the days in the season? 
Or there's another option now which hasn't been built in here yet, but that's weighted averages of the months where the monthly values are weighted by um, the number of days in the month. And it looks like that's what's done in LCAT right now. So uh, you have these different methods, and your results will change a little bit depending on which one you choose. Um, and right now, uh, average of the month seems to be a little bit more popular, so we give that as a default. But you can get the average of the days if you want to. Then uh, the extremes program is pretty much the same as it was before, although you do have uh, a few more options. You can uh, restrict the date range. Uh, you can set your threshold for missing values. Uh, so we can just pull up an example here if you wanted to do snowfall, uh, greatest three-day snowfall. It does take a little bit longer for this product to generate, just like it did in the old uh, Eximasis, because it is churning through quite a bit of data. But there are your, your top 10 greatest three-day snowfall events. So that's pretty much the same. Uh, consecutive days program can be run in two different modes. We want to look at days, say, above 90 degrees, and we want the top 10 longest runs. And it will run through give those for you. So you can see there, were, there was a 9, an 8, a few 7s, a few 6s. So those are the top 10. Uh, but maybe what you would like to see is all the days that had runs of 5 days or more. So that is the second way uh, that you can run this. And here it will just give you a listing of all the runs that were 5 days in, in length or longer. Next product is first and last days. Uh, this is usually used to, com uh, to compute frost dates. So we give you a, a default here of minimum temperatures of 32 degrees or below. You can, of course, uh, change the, the variable or the uh, comparison type or the value that you're, that you're looking at here. And let's bring up a, an example here that has something to, to talk to you. So what we're given here is the last spring occurrence of a 32 degree temperature and what it was on that morning. And then the first occurrence in the fall of 32 degrees. And the difference here is the number of days in between. Now there are a few other options over here for period beginning and pairing results that um, allow you to do a lot of different types of summaries. And it's something you might want to play around a little bit with to, uh, to really focus in on, on what you're looking for. It gives you a lot more flexibility than in the old version. For instance, if we want to look at snowfall uh, events of one inch or more, and here we would uh, get the same type of thing. We would get the last one in the spring and the first one in the fall and the number of days in between. But what we might really be interested in is kind of a length of the snow season. So the amount of time between the first one in the fall and the last one in the spring, that's where we can change our option for pairing results and do it by season instead, and then we get it that way. Here's, here's the first occurrence um, in the fall and paired up with the last occurrence in the spring and the number of days in between. And these also have uh, options that you can set for number of missing days, uh, whether or not this value on that day is included or not, and you can get the, the count of missing days to uh, see if there are different years that you want to exclude. Uh, normals are, are pretty standard. They're the NCDC normals. You can get either monthly or daily normals. Uh, here we're looking at monthly because you both the uh, the graph with all the options for uh, hovering over values uh, to get them to come up, and the, the printing and, and saving options up in the upper right. And then below, uh, you have a table of the values as well. Uh, let's pick daily and let's look at precipitation. And there you get values. Uh, it's doing accumulated precipitation uh, on the graph, and then all the individual daily values in the table below. And those are, of course, uh, 1981 to, to 2010 uh, normals, the standard normal period. And the other single station product that is new is 
the last one here called Station Information. And on this one, it's just a, a repeat of what we saw in the station selection box when you clicked on a station. It gives you that a station summary. So uh, here it just has a, a menu selection off the, the main menu, so you don't have to go through the, the search option to find, to find the station. So those wrap up the single station products. Now we'll move into the new multi-station products. Um, a lot of the option selections are similar to what you've seen in the other products. Um, so here we're going to be looking at data for today, uh, May 21st, 2013. You can click off the variables that we want. And then now for the multi-station products, we have a different station selection uh, uh, options here, different ways to select the stations that you want included in your product. Uh, first, you can select uh, by particular areas. You can either select a, a state that you want. Uh, I have Connecticut here. Um, if you want to select by CWA, you can click on that. Um, and so you can click around uh, among the different CWAs that cover any part of Connecticut. Uh, as you click on selections over here, they will be mirrored in the selection box over here on the left. And you can also look by the NCDC climate divisions. There are three of those in, in Connecticut. Or you can look by river basin. Uh, here we have the different river basins that cover any portion of Connecticut. You can select from the, from the list or from the map. And sometimes FEMA and county extension agents might look might uh, look for stations by county, so you can collect uh, select any county in the state. So for our example here, let's go back to CWA, and we're going to pick the Albany area CWA, and we're going to go and retrieve our selection. And it, as you can see, it's pretty quick. Uh, it went through, grabbed every station. Uh, that reported this morning from the Albany CWA and gives the, the five variables that we had selected off in our chart. So there's all the values. Uh, it can be pretty handy. Again, these are, are sortable columns. So if you want to see the, the warmest temperature in your CWA uh, this morning, you can get that. Uh, if you want to see the lowest minimum temperature, you can get that. And it's also a, a useful QC tool because I think that right there is probably a, a bad observation. I don't think it was 32 degrees even in Stillwater Reservoir this morning. Then we can go to monthly data. Uh, same type of thing here. We can select the, the variable that we want and the, the summarization method like we did in a lot of other uh, programs that we had looked at. Let's do precipitation sum. and. See, let's just bring that up again for, for the CWA here. So we've got a, a number of stations here. Um, you might notice, uh, if you're familiar with Kokora stations, that a lot of these on here are Kokora stations. Usually when they have something like the station name with a, a distance and direction after it, that's uh, usually a pretty good sign that it's a um, it might be a Kokora station, especially if the distance is in uh, tenths of a mile. Uh, we can set our maximum number of missing days in the month, and that will probably take out some of the stations that, that were didn't have enough data here, didn't meet our criteria. Uh, and you can do include date of occurrence and things like that. So uh, similar to daily data, except now it's summarized for a month. And if you don't want daily or monthly, but have some particular date range that you're interested in, uh, you can select any starting and ending date. So I won't, won't go through an example of that. Now, uh, one of the two products that might be rather slow if you have limited bandwidth, and that is the record values for a day. And I am just going to start this running, and then I'll come back and explain uh, what I am doing in the in the setup here and but first before I do that um, I did uh, want to show you the other type of way of selecting the stations that you want we went through all the different
states and areas, the final way is to do a bounding box. And with a bounding box, you can uh, select the drawing tool over here on the left, and then you can draw a box around the area that you're interested in. And you will get all the stations in that box. To get kind of a preview of how many stations there are, you can collect the show stations and box button, and it will give you the, the locations of all the stations. And again, if you want to, you can click on those to get information on the station. So let's uh, bring up our results for, for the stations in this bounding box. So what it's doing, it's going through, um, I specified that I wanted stations that are active for 2013. So I don't want to get all the stations that were only open for a few years back in the 80s or something like that. I want currently active stations, so I selected that. You can type in period of record here if you, if you want to get um, all of the stations that have ever existed. Uh, the analysis period uh, for the extremes, the record values that I'm showing here is for the, the period of record. I selected May 14th. Uh, last Tuesday, and I was looking for lowest minimum temperature. So for each of the stations in my box, I have what the record temperature was for that day and the year it occurred. And you'll notice that there were several stations here that set records this year. So the one thing you can do to have them show up a little bit more is you can compare um, your results to any year that you want. So here I'm interested in 2013, so I'm going to select that. And it goes through again and computes it. And any of the ones that are records are highlighted in red. So you can easily see those. And probably the first thing that you would think is, OK, what was the old record? Because we're showing the value this year is 27. The record is 27. Uh, you can go to your analysis period and just change that to 2012. And it will give you the records for that period instead, and then you'll see what the what the previous record was. So this this first one was tied with a value in 1996. Uh, Elmira's was warmer than uh, 2007, and it gives you the the valid date range to see that some of these were were for a pretty short period of time. The other one that is a bandwidth tag is multi-station extremes. You'll see that the setup is very similar to the setup that uh, you have for the regular Extremes pro uh, product. This time I'm going to look for all stations for the entire period of record. I'm going to do the analysis for the period of record. I'm going to look for snowfall. I want the highest one-day snowfall. And I'm going to select my state. And I want to do this for Connecticut. And I'm going to set that running. And this is going to take a while. But why did I do this? Well, uh, back in February of this year, we had a very strong storm that moved into the Northeast and gave copious amounts of snowfall to Connecticut. And the folks in Connecticut thought that they had an all-time one-day snowfall record for the state. And so we needed to be able to verify that that was uh, indeed a record. So with this, I uh, like I said, I selected all stations that ever existed in Connecticut and looked at the snowfall record for every station. So essentially, I'm reading in the entire snowfall database for the state of Connecticut and picking out the highest values. And uh, yeah, we ran into a few problems there, but let's see. Yeah, so we did uh, get almost to the end here. And you can see that uh, Ansonia, Connecticut, with 36 inches, did set a record uh, this year on February uh, 9, 2013. And you can also see that there were uh, some other values that also set uh, single station records for that day. But this was a product that, was being, uh, that I was able to run very quickly and, and pick out uh, the highest value for the state. And it is. Uh, it does consume quite a bit of bandwidth, and you might have problems with that. Um, but that, like I said, that's something that we're going to be working on and speeding it up in the future. And the, the final product that we have was something that was uh, asked for by the, the drought folks, ones that do drought monitoring. Um, if we want to look at data for a period ending yesterday, we can look for the 
total amount of precipitation. Uh, we still have it set to all the stations in Connecticut. And we have the precipitation for the last 30, 60, 90, 180 days since the beginning of the year and since October 1st. Um, so if you're doing drought monitoring, that might turn out to be pretty handy. You can also get the departure of nor from normal if you'd rather look at it that way. So that will, that will come up as well. If you are a little bit more lenient with the number of missing days, say we allow 10 days missing, and we go back to total precipitation, where we should be getting a few more stations. Yeah, we get the cocoa rest stations here that um, we don't get the data for them until usually a couple of days after the fact from NCDC. So that's why we had to be a little bit more lenient with our uh, allowable number of missing days to get them to be included in the summary. And so those are the products. Uh, one thing that I hadn't pointed out before is up here at the, at the top of the screen, it's a kind of a little helper bar with three icons on it. If you uh, click the uh, question mark, it will give you some help. There's not too much there right now, but I think as uh, questions start coming in and um, we get some comments, we will uh, probably put together an FAQ and have that posted there and some other helpful hints uh, for stumbling blocks that people might run into. So that area will be expanding in the future. We also have some settings that you can set. Uh, you can play around with a little bit of the font size for the input um, or probably something that you would be more likely to use would be to change the font size for the results. So if you're on a smaller screen maybe and uh, you wanted to set your font size a, a little bit smaller, you can do that and uh, get more data on the screen, uh, make it a little bit easier to read. And you can also toggle the accordion interface. Uh, this interface over here is called the accordion because when you click on one, one section will expand and, and the other will contract. If you don't like that, uh, some of our beta testers didn't, you can turn that off and you'll get both your options and station selection expanded uh, so you have everything right there in front of you. And also we have some tool tips you might have noticed. Uh, like here, uh, it's gonna give you a little bit of information. Uh, click there for the calendar. Here's the format we want for the date. Uh, here's what we mean by number of missing days. So these are all referred to as tool tips. And you can deactivate those if you find them to be annoying popping up all over your screen. And so now, you see as you hover over things, uh, they no longer come up. So it gives you a, a little bit of control over the settings. And finally, if you were just going to go in and print this page, it would probably come out looking kind of weird. You might get the, all the selections over here and the product, they might show up on different pages. But if you use the, the print button here, it will just give you your results and it will make it a, a lot easier to, to print your output. Uh, so a little helpful little icon there for, for you to use. So if I get out of here now, if I can find my way back to my presentation. There we go. Just a minute here. There's what I wanted. Okay, so, uh, a few URLs for you. Um, if you want to get into XMASIS 2 right away this afternoon or tomorrow and start working with it, showing it to your colleagues, everything like that, you can get to it using uh, this URL, XMTest rccasis.org. Um, we plan to release XMASIS 2 under the current XMASIS URL, that would be xmasis.rcc-asis.org, uh, either tomorrow or Thursday. And so at that point, you'll be able to go right to the uh, URL that you hopefully have bookmarked and go right into XMASIS 2. Uh, again, we will have a link on that page uh, to what I'll now refer to as classic XMASIS, and that's oldxmasis.rccasis.org. So you'll still be able to get to that uh, once the XMASIS 
uh, URL becomes active, uh, I will not guarantee that the XM test URL will still be available. So I wouldn't bookmark that, but if you really want to use it in the next couple of days, it's uh, available at that location. But uh, by Wednesday or Thursday, when you go into Eximasis, uh, what you will be seeing is, is Eximasis 2. And uh, a reminder to anybody that doesn't have this URL bookmark to please use this, art, this URL. I know that some people out there are still using the original URLs that we sent out that sent you to a specific regional climate center. Uh, last week we had a, a power outage at our center that took down Eximasis. So if you were coming into eximasis.nrcc.cornell.edu, which was the old URL, you would have been out of luck. But if you had this URL uh, bookmarked and went to this, uh, you would have still been in business because you would have automatically been redirected to the High Plains Regional Climate Center, which didn't suffer from the power outage. So if you don't have it, bookmarked as, as the rccasis.org uh, website, please replace any uh, RCC-specific websites with, with this one. And then when we make the change uh, in a couple of days, you'll be able to go uh, right into it. So uh, that's the end of the presentation. Um, I don't know if Marina has any, any closing words. Uh, thanks, Keith. This is Jenna, and I, I just unmuted Marina if she does want to say something, but we do have about 10 to 12 questions. Uh, thank you, Keith, uh, and I think we will go now to the questions. We would like to record them as well. I think Jenna will be facilitating asking uh, the questions, and Keith will provide the answers. Right, yeah. So I'll just, um, how many do you want me to, do you want me to try and get through all of them, Marina? Yes, please. Okay, I will. All right, so Keith, the first question um, comes from Ingrid Amberger. Can this data be posted to social media? Can uh, the products? Yeah, if you want to save the product as a, as a JPEG or a ping, and uh, yeah, you can feel free to, to post that anywhere you like. Okay, great. Most, um, of, them have, most of them have the, the regional client or the uh, ACES acknowledgement on them, but if they don't, it would be nice to, to uh, acknowledge ACES as the source of the graphic. Okay, awesome. All right, this, this question, I believe, came in around the time when you were on the single station demo. Uh, for the first and last dates, can you sort by the earliest or latest by clicking on the header as with the other table? Yes. Yes, you, you can okay. click on those uh, just like the other ones and, and we'll sort it for you. Okay, that question was from Dave Bernhardt. Uh, okay. The next question, Clinton Rocky, due to the, do, do the older co-op stations uh, max temperature occur on the day of occurrence or on the day reported? For example, the stations that report at 8 a.m. where the high is the previous day. Right. Those will be on the day that they were recorded, day that, that they were reported. So if it's an 8 a.m. observer, uh, the high temperature will be uh, listed on the day that it was recorded, which or <laughs> I guess I should say reported, the day it was reported, which would be the following day. So that's the okay. standard that uh, all the data from NCDC is displayed that way as well, and, and we're following suit. And, and leaving it on the day where it was reported. Okay, great. Next question again from David Bernhardt. Is the coca Ross and other data updated regularly? So if I check at different times throughout the day, uh, will I see additional reports for today? Okay, um, the data in general is being updated several times during the day. Um, so if there are weather coder observations coming in, uh, throughout the morning, uh, we usually update those about every hour throughout the morning, and then a little more irregularly during the rest of the day. Uh, for COCORAS, that data is currently coming through NCDC. Uh, their access to the COCORAS is um, kind of delayed. Usually, they don't get it until a couple of days after the fact, 
and on weekends you don't get any of the weekend data until like Monday afternoon. Uh, that's something that we're working with the COCORAS people on where we intend to get the data directly from them so it will be available in much closer to real time. But uh, for the time being, uh, right now, uh, there is a delay on that data. Okay, great. Thank you. The next question comes from um, Stephen Capriola. Can you get data for a particular holiday that doesn't fall on the same date every year, for example, Thanksgiving? Okay. Uh, yep, we did have that request come in from a few of our, our beta testers. Uh, that is something that, that uh, we have on the list to add in the future, but uh, don't have it in place right now. But he's not the only one to ask for it. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, David Bernhardt again asks, is there a way to find the longest periods during which a certain precip accumulation has occurred, such as the longest periods with less than one inch? Um, no, I can't think of a way of doing that right now. I guess I hadn't hit it, uh, anticipated that one, so <laughs> no, I, I can't a think of a way that, that uh, we can do that right now. Uh, you do, of course, have the ability to download all the daily data and uh, put it into an Excel spreadsheet, and you could probably work out a formula in Excel to do it, but uh, not directly at Exony. Okay, so Gary Sanger writes, the California water year runs from July 1st to June 30th. Can we change the default dates for the water year? Uh, you can't change the uh, default for the, the water year. Uh, that's set to be October 1st through September 30th. But in all the programs where you can select water years and option, you also have the option to uh, click to type in your own starting and ending date. So you can type in the, the starting and ending dates for, for your water year uh, to get it that way. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is from Rick Toman. Uh, in some of the examples shown, many of the stations have period of records starting in the 1948-49 time frame, which in many cases is not the full period of record but only reflects the NCDC digitization. Any plans to extend the period of record when available? Uh, we have done that for quite a number of stations. Uh, if the local offices or state climatologists are able to uh, key the data into an Excel spreadsheet, uh, they can forward that to us, and then we are happy to uh, run that through our processing and add it to the ACES database. Uh, a number of offices uh, have already done this for, um, like, their first order stations uh, that go into ThreadX. They might have had some data that was available on old uh, paper records that they were able to type into, into Excel and send it to us, and we added it right in there, and, and it will appear in, in XMASIS. So, yes, that, that certainly is uh, possible if, if you're able to uh, spend the time to, to key punch it up and, and send it on to us. Okay, great. Um, the next question comes from Matthew Kidwell. Um, in the multi-station listings, it seems like it would be helpful to know what time of or what type of each um, station one is. Uh, for instance, raw is included. I believe you you went over this in the beginning, so maybe he missed this. Well, uh, I think what he means is in the in the output, when I when I show the results, it might be helpful to include the station type. On the precipitation summary, which was the very last product that I showed, uh, where we had the, the table, where it, it had the stations, and then the precipitation amounts for the different time periods, in that product, it, it does have the station types listed. And uh, yeah, we could certainly add that information to uh, to the other multi-station products as well. So, good suggestion. Okay, the next question is from Stephen Capriola again. Will access change for our web users? And then I'm just going to link this with another question from Jesse Lee. Uh, is there any plan to open XMASIS to general users outside the .gov domain? Okay, yeah, both of those questions are, are pretty much along the same line. Um, XMASIS 2 is 
aimed primarily at the National Weather Service. Uh, so we would prefer you not to uh, spread the URL around, um, but there isn't a restriction on access like there was on the original Eximasis. Uh, the thing that we're going to be working on uh, right away now that XMASIS 2 is, is out the door and, and operational is an upgrade of now data. And so that is where users will have access to a much broader range of products and now data will not be uh, kind of crippled uh, the way it is now. You have a very limited amount of data in, in now data now <clears throat> that's going to be opened up where you'll have access to everything. And it, the uh, interface and the products will be very similar to what is uh, now available in XMASIS 2. So that, that will be the next uh, product that will be received in this major upgrade. Okay, great. Um, David Bernhardt asks again, will the ThreadX sites be available here? Yeah, yep, the ThreadX sites are available uh, on the station lists. Uh, they appear at the top of every station list. And you can also type in the ThreadX ID if you know what that is. Usually it is the three-letter airport identifier followed by THR. So like for Albany, it's A-L-B-T-H-R. Um, yeah, so those will be available. Um, one. I guess they're, yeah, so you can get to them in the single station products. Right now, they aren't appearing in the multi-station products. And the reason that is is because they don't have a latitude and longitude assigned to them uh, because the location has changed over time. Uh, but we are going to go in and assign a latitude and longitude to each of the ThreadX stations, probably the latitude and longitude of the current location so that it will show up when you're doing some of the area searches, like all the stations in a county or in a state or like that. So um, right now they, they aren't in those multi-station products, uh, but you should be seeing them appear fairly shortly. OK, and we have another question from John Ice. Do we have any exercises or job sheets that the offices may use for hands-on training? Maybe Marina would. Yeah. Thank you for that one, too. Marina, I just unmuted you. Uh, thank you, Jenna. Uh, good question. We didn't plan, but, you know, if there is a need for this, we can definitely develop the one. Good idea. And, Marina, if you'd like to ask your question, you can, you're the last one. Uh, okay. Uh, Keith, I wanted to ask, uh, can we download the data in a different format? You know, you mentioned that we can take data to uh, XM. Uh, to Excel, for, for example, how can we do this? Uh, most of the products have an option for CSV output, which is the, the text output that we chose. Uh, that's uh, pretty flexible and imports into Excel quite easily. Um, but if there are other formats that people use a lot, we, we could certainly work on incorporating them. Uh, we thought CSV was the most flexible. And, so that's what's in there at this point. And just about every product has a, a CSV option. Thank you very much, Keith. This was a great presentation. I, I think, Jenna, is, this was the last question you mentioned, right? Um, well, just two more just came in, so I'll ask okay. them real quickly. Um, this one comes from Clyde Lock Lockyer. Can display multi-station output on a Google map? Um, not right now, uh, but that, that's a, a good suggestion. Uh, and that's uh, another thing that, that we are uh, actively working on. So uh, I'm not sure exactly a, a time frame for when that will be available, but um, that's definitely something that's, that's currently being developed. And then the last one is, Keith, not sure you want to do this, but do you, would you like to provide them with an email address um, if they have any technical questions, or is there like a help button? On uh, yep. If I go. Or contact us. Yeah. Uh, let's see. If you click on the XMASIS 2 logo at the top of the left column, 
that will bring up some information on the, the version number and so on. And you can use that uh, mail to link there. That's xmasis underscore nrcc at cornell.edu. And Great. that will, will send xmasis to questions directly to me. Great. OK, well, that does it for all of the questions. Thank you very much, Keith. OK, you're Mar welcome. Marina, do you have any closing statements you'd like to make? That is uh, that's very good. Thank you, Jenna. Uh, thank you, Keith, very much. This was a very good and useful presentation. We are going to record. Uh, we recorded this presentation. We are going to develop this and post it on uh, NWS uh, Professional Development Series website. Everybody will be sent a link uh, to this presentation and its location. It will be also available uh, through XMASIS, um, new XMASIS link when it will become um, operationally uh, released. And um, uh, you will be also notified uh, about uh, learning management system posting of XMASIS training tool. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. Great questions. Uh, and um, I wish you all the best for the rest of the day. Have a good time.